wind was exceptionally, exceptionally high. We're talking 50 mile an hour winds. With every passing moment, it just intensified. Looked up and the fire was running like I've never seen it run. There's fire all the way around the vehicle. Our visibility was zero at that point. We saw the travel of this fire through the dense forest with the 45 mile an hour winds with 62 mile an hour gusts traveled seven and a half miles in five hours. And then Dar and Peregrine has been overrun. Dar and Peregrine has been overrun. So we saw a fire along the driveway, fire along this, this wall here, and it was, it was coming this way. June 11th, 2013. The Black Forest Fire explodes and becomes the most destructive fire in Colorado's history. Two lives were lost, nearly 500 homes were destroyed, and over 14,000 acres of beautiful but overgrown Ponderosa Pine Forest burned. Like many areas in the West, 100 years of vigorous fire suppression and little thinning of trees had turned this beloved forest into a powder keg. Think of a solar flare. Think of an atom bomb. Maybe that's overly melodramatic, but we have to think of something releasing with that level of energy. But before this bomb went off, it was a small fire, spreading quickly but burning on the ground, not yet in the tops or crowns of the trees. Uh, quick, quick floor, push the fire to the west. Turbocharged by the wind and with lots of dry fuel, the fire quickly spread to the crowds and from the treetops to the homes. Within minutes, it was affecting homes and, 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 and destroying properties, uh, and it just didn't let up. We were seeing 40, 50, 60 mile an hour gusts that were causing us to withdraw several times because it would roll it into the crowns. What's more, the crown fire produced a shower of hot embers that landed far out in front of the inferno that created them. This tarp was under that shower. There's over 300 hot ember melts in this trampoline tarp. If you imagine this blizzard of embers coming towards your home ahead of the fire. That blizzard of sparks landed on flammable wooden decks and wood piles, on years worth of pine needles, and in mulch beds right next to houses. Embers floated into attics through ineffective vent screens and homes burned down from the inside out. We're going to try to reposition to protect that home. Choosing where to safely defend property can be a tough decision, especially when confronted with anxious evacuees, intense heat, choking smoke, and the chaos of a raging crown fire. And when the fire is right here, right now, you don't have the luxury of going back in and investigating. You have to go to the one that you can make a determination from the pavement. Firefighters agree, decisions about where to stand and fight are easier if a property has been mitigated. Mitigation means the trees have been thinned out and excess dead wood and pine needles have been removed from the forest floor. Mitigation includes removing the ladder fuels, low-hanging branches and tall grass, weeds or brush that can expand the fire from the ground into the trees. Less fuel means a less intense fire, and that allows firefighters to do their jobs. And it gave us a benefit for those that had mitigated their property, it gave us an edge. Dave Hawkins fought the fire both in mitigated neighborhoods and in overgrown areas along Shoop Road. When we were out on Shoop, it was it was a totally different ball game. Uh, you could hear the the roar of the fire. The smoke was very much more intense, and it, and it to the point where you couldn't see anything, uh, just holding your hand in front of your face. Given a choice, firefighters will try to protect all homes, mitigated or not. That's what we come to work to do. We we want to protect everybody that we serve, the people, their home, their property. You know, that's that's what we do. We're their we're their public service. However, during crown fires, overgrown forests and properties threaten both firefighters and their equipment. Mitigated areas increase safety and improve the firefighters' ability to protect neighborhoods. Just FYI, we lost the garage up here, but we're holding on to the house. 
got to think about our firefighters and their safety. We want all of them to go home every night or after every fire. We got our tools out. And we started Engine boss Rudy Gillette and his crew defended many Black Forest homes. This was one of them. Among the factors in its favor, it's built with fire-resistant materials. The homes are made out of stucco. It's got some rock, composite shingles. So the home, it had a good chance at survivability. A lot of vegetation near the home had been thinned. There's a green lawn bordered by a driveway that helps create what firefighters call defensible space, an area where they can safely work to help a home survive. But defensible space is tough to create on the fly. We have minutes when we get there. We don't have time to walk your whole property and mitigate the whole property. The decision to defend a home or not may change as fire conditions change. In fact, Black Forest has many examples of firefighters waiting out a crown fire and then rejoining the fight when it was safer. And it was mitigation, the work done to reduce the amount of fuel before the fire, which often caused the fire's behavior to die down. The key thing to this whole operation was what the homeowner did prior to us even getting here. The Black Forest Reserve was another area threatened by Crown Fire. And the Crown Fire itself lasted uh, 45 seconds to a minute and, and went approximately a third to a half of a mile. Because of the environment that the homeowners left us, um, we were able to re-engage quickly and come in and suppress the fire around the home. Walt Seeley was a volunteer firefighter, and he's been mitigating his 10 acres for over a decade. Start out close to the house and work our way out, thin the trees. They're competing so hard for oxygen, for moisture, for sunlight. None of them does well. So we started sawing them out, eliminating many, leaving a few. The few that do uh, remain survive and thrive. Seeley's efforts meant the fire largely stayed out of the crowns, and so most of his trees survived. His years of work and good defensible space meant firefighters could protect the house safely without retreating. Equipment, mitigation, defensible space, fire-resistant buildings, good access to homes, and trained firefighters all help preserve properties in a wildfire. But when you have areas as overgrown as the Black Forest was, and in many places still is, there are no guarantees. Wind-driven crown fires create what firefighters know as extreme fire behavior. There really wasn't much that anybody could do to stop it. Mother Nature was in charge. Ron Culp retired from the Colorado Springs Fire Department and had thinned many trees on his property. It was not enough against a crown fire. I've been told that we had temperatures between 2,500 and 2,800 degrees. But if you really do the, the mitigation that you should do, your place will survive except in an extreme firestorm like we had. The more mitigation an area has, the better the survival odds for people, for property, for firefighters, and for the forest itself. If you can imagine a community quilt and all the homes in that neighborhood are a square on the quilt. Well, one square looks really good by itself, but when you add another square and another square, all of a sudden it gets better and better and better. And that's how it works with mitigation. Mitigated neighborhoods, like High Forest Ranch, are where firefighters had the greatest success during the Black Forest Fire. About that time I looked up and it happened to get up in the crowds making a crown run right at us. Everybody made a quick retreat back to the safety zone, but because of the mitigation work that neighborhood had done, it died down back to a ground fire really quick. We were able to work hard and do good work and save the whole neighborhood. A vicious crown fire also came roaring toward the Cathedral Pines area. It's another example where mitigation on a community-wide scale altered the fire's behavior and allowed firefighters to safely protect homes. So the fact that the community overall was, was mitigated was a huge component. It was done at a landscape scale, which kept big fire from entering the community. We're still fighting a ground fire versus a crown fire. One to two foot flame links coming into the neighborhood versus 150 to 200 foot flame links coming into the neighborhood. And so we utilized that community and continuous string of mitigated properties as a point to hold the fire, and it was a success.
and community-wide mitigation efforts help preserve the forest as well as properties. Folks as a community need to look at why they live where they live. Most people that live out in these type of uh, wooded environments are here because of the woods. You may be able to do mitigation around your home that can save your structure during a fire and that's obviously well worth doing. If the fire destroys a lot of the vegetation in the community, that takes away your reason for living there in the first place. So it's a preservation of lifestyle, it's a preservation of the environment. I can rebuild a house, but I cannot rebuild 120, 140 year old forest. Ponderosa pine is well adapted to surviving ground fire, but crown fires destroy almost everything. So it's worth asking, can more be done, not just to protect homes and keep firefighters safe, but also to preserve the land, the land which makes our homes home? How can we protect the values of why we moved here in the first place? We have to be good stewards. It's for the trees, it's for the wildlife, it's for the privacy. It's for the extra value that trees give us. Be proactive, get out there before an incident of this magnitude hits and do, do some clearing on your own, help us. You love these big trees and they're beautiful and you hate to cut some of them down, but you do have to remove some to save uh, the rest of the forest. We have a lot of areas that are still highly volatile and so the challenge is to develop a partnership develop a partnership between the property owner and your fire department and the expertise that they can help in developing home survivability. The future threat is now. We have to do mitigation work on a community level, on a countywide level, on a statewide level, now. It's imperative. Without a dedicated, long-term commitment to community-wide mitigation, firefighters say there are many neighborhoods along the Palmer Divide and beyond where wildfire will continue to pose a deadly serious threat to residents, to first responders, to homes, and to our forests and the life those forests provide. It's a wonderful place to live. We just need to be more responsible. <laughs>